Hello, my name is Sandra Allison, and I will be lecturing on ultrasound of the foot and ankle. I have nothing to disclose. The objectives of this talk will be to learn about ankle and foot structures that can be imaged with ultrasound, recognize the sonographic appearance of the normal ankles, tendons, and ligaments, and describe the sonographic features of common ankle and foot pathology. Okay. The ankle is divided into four compartments, and they can be imaged in four compartments. For the posterior compartment, we will be discussing the Achilles tendon, which is the structure that is outlined on blue in this Netter diagram. Now, the appearance of a normal Achilles tendon is the same as with any tendon in the body. Tendons are hyperechoic. They are composed of fine parallel echogenic lines, which represent collagen fibers. In this case, we are looking at the Achilles tendon as it comes from proximal to distal towards its insertion onto the calcaneus. Now, distally at the insertion, we may see an area of decreased echogenicity in the tendon, which is due to anisotropy. To prove that this is not pathology, we would reorient the tendon by flexing or extending the ankle, or reorient the transducer to bring those fine parallel echogenic lines into view, bring them perpendicular to the beam, and increase the echogenicity in that area of the tendon. Now, when normal tendon architecture is not seen, one of the differential diagnoses would be a tendon rupture. In this case, this patient presented with acute posterior heel pain uh, and tenderness and swelling, and came with a diagnosis of Achilles rupture. Here we have lost the normal tendon pathology, the normal tendon appearance. We don't see those fine parallel echogenic lines, and instead we see this hyper to hypoechoic heterogeneous fluid collection in the expected location of the tendon, uh, and this is an example of Achilles tendon rupture. Now, many times you may see a uh, tendinous structure that is medial to the Achilles tendon, and this is the plantaris tendon, which we don't want to mistake for intact Achilles fibers. Now, tendinosis is another type of pathology that can affect tendons. In this case, we are looking at a chronic repetitive injury to tendons uh, that can lead to mucoid degeneration in the tendon and can even progress to tears. Now, here we are looking at the right Achilles tendon and then the normal left Achilles tendon. So you can see on the right, the tendon is hypoechoic, it's thickened, we've lost some of its normal tendon architecture, uh, and this is a case with Achilles tendinosis. Now measurements can sometimes be useful because when you're not sure if you're looking at pathology, you may see that there is a difference with the unaffected side. Another thing to point out is that even very small ten, uh, measurement differences may in fact be relatively um, or proportionately significant, uh, such as in this case. On the transverse view, the normal tendon has a normal football or ovoid shape. It is uniformly hyperechoic, whereas this tendon, which has the tendinosis, has focal thickening of the medial aspect of the tendon, which is the more common location for tendinosis. Also, with tendinosis, we may find increased vascularity with power Doppler imaging, and one should always be careful to not compress or uh, have a handy, heavy hand when scanning so as to compress these vessels um, during the scan. Now, with more advanced or severe cases, you may completely lose normal tendon architecture. So in this case, we are looking at an Achilles tendon that is significantly or markedly thickened. It is hypoechoic. We've lost its normal architecture. Um, another thing to point out is that the tendon is not involved at its insertion, but rather proximal, uh, closer to the myotendinous junction. Over time, calcium may form within the tendon. So this is a case of calcific tendinosis. You see calcifications within the tendon just at uh, near its insertion onto the calcaneus. Moving on to the medial ankle, we are looking at three tendons. The tibialis posterior tendon, which is outlined in blue, flexor digitorum longus tendon, which is outlined in red, and flexor hallucis longus tendon, which is outlined in green. Between the digitorum and hallucis longus tendons, are the structures that travel within the tarsal tunnel, which is covered by this flexor retinaculum. And these structures are the posterior tibial artery and veins, as well as the tibial nerve. 
the axial view, we are looking at the tibialis posterior tendon up against the medial malleolus. Adjacent to that is the flexor digitorum longus tendon. But the flexor hallucis longus tendon is frequently not seen in the same view due to anisotropy. In between, we are looking at the tibial, tibial nerve, and we are looking at the posterior tibial artery, and then the posterior tibial veins, which are right here. Okay. Uh, long axis, this looks just like the other tendons. We see the fine parallel echogenic lines and a very hyperechoic tendon as it traverses around the medial malleolus. Again, as it dives distal to the malleolus, you can see that we have a drop in echogenicity. And in order to determine whether this is pathology versus anisotropy, you'd like to reorient the transducer and uh, align the tendon perpendicular to the ultrasound beam. It is also normal to have a small amount of fluid adjacent to the posterior tibialis tendon just beyond the, the medial malleolus and just prior to its insertion. Now, when you see a lot of fluid, what you might want to think about is tenosynovitis. Uh, tenosynovitis is an inflammatory condition. We see fluid surrounding the tendons within the tendon sheath. We may see thickening of the tendon sheath. Uh, the tendon themselves may look abnormal. There may be hypoechoic nodular areas within the tendon or heterogeneity of the tendon. There is typically increased vascularity during uh, this inflammatory condition, and you can detect that with power Doppler. You don't always see fluid surrounding the tendon, but you may see uh, ill definition of the tendons and tendon sheath. Now, tarsal tunnel is um, uh, an area where the nerve can become entrapped. So just like with carpal tunnel, where you have entrapment of the median nerve, we are looking at entrapment of the tibial nerve at the level of the tarsal tunnel. Here we see a anechoic to hypoechoic multilobulated structure that is in the region of the tarsal tunnel. This is a ganglion cyst. Now this patient felt pain, especially every time they flex their foot. You can see with a change in the foot, you can see that this ganglion shifts medially and will actually displace and compress on the adjacent tibial nerve. Moving on to the lateral ankle, we are looking at the perineus longus tendon and the perineus brevis tendon. On the lateral, at the uh, lateral malleolus and the axial view, if you want a mnemonic, you can remember that the brevis is against the bone, B brevis bone, and the longus is sitting superficial to or lateral to the uh, brevis tendon. Long axis view, the tendons, you can again see that they're uniformly hyperechoic and are composed of fine fibrillar echogenic uh, lines. Distal to the malleolus, the longus and the brevis uh, diverge with the longus diving deeper as it wraps around the foot and the brevis extending towards its insertion on the base of the fifth metatarsal. Okay, so just like with the prior case, this patient presenting with lateral ankle pain, but in this case we have a tenosynovitis involving the perineal tendons. So we're looking at the perineus longus and brevis within their tendon sheath, and we see fluid surrounding the tendons, increased vascularity on power Doppler, perhaps thickening of the synovial sheath, and decreased echogenicity or heterogeneity involving the tendons. Uh, one can perform interventions when they see uh, inflammatory conditions of the ankle tendons. In this case, this is an injection into the lateral uh, or perineal tendon sheath. We see these tendons are enlarged, they're hypoechoic, they're surrounded by complex fluid. And in this image, we are seeing the needle viewed with a uh, linear transducer in plane as it is inserting into the tendon sheath and uh, injecting around the tendons. Now, a special thing that can happen with a perineal tendon is a subluxation or dislocation of the tendon. The nice thing about ultrasound is that the uh, subluxing or snapping structures can be imaged with a dynamic scan. So here we have the transducer over the perineal tendons and we're having the patient perform the maneuver that causes the clicking in their ankle. Okay, just to orient you, we are looking at the fibula over here we are looking at the brevis, perineus brevis, and the perineus longus. Now we have the patient perform the maneuver, and you can see now we are looking at three tendons. So now we are looking at 
two longest, I'm sorry, brevis tendons and one longest tendon. So not only is the brevis subluxed or dislocated, but the, it is also split. Second, there is fluid surrounding the tendons within the tendon sheath. Moving on to other causes of uh, ankle pain, here we are looking at the lateral ankle ligaments, which are com most commonly involved with ankle sprains. Here we're looking at the anterior talofibular ligament in red, the calcaneofibular ligament in green. Note that it is deep to the perineal longus and brevis tendons right here. And we're looking at the anterior tibiofibular ligament in blue, okay? Normal appearance. The nice thing about ligaments is that they are named after their uh, bony attachment sites. So here we're looking at the anterior talofibular ligament going across from the talus to the fibula, the calcaneofibular ligament, which attaches to the calcaneus and the fibula, deep to the perineal tendons, and then we are looking at the tibiofibular ligament bridging from the fibula to the tibia. Now here is a uh, radiology resident who uh, was playing volleyball over the weekend and as they landed on their foot, they felt a pop followed by some swelling. This is the normal talofibular ligament. And on this side we see there is fluid deep to the ligament, superficial to the ligament, and tracking through a defect into the ligament. The calcaneofibular ligament, you can see extending normally from the fibula to the calcaneus, just deep to the tendons. On the affected side, we see that there is a hypoechoic area, which may represent fluid or abnormal ligament, uh, which was also sprained. The anterior tibiofibular ligament was normal. Moving on to the anterior ankle tendons, we are looking at the tibialis anterior tendon, we're looking at the extensor hallucis longus tendon, and the extensor digitorum longus tendon. The anterior tibialis tendon has the same appearance as the Achilles tendon and other tendons in the body. It is composed of fine fibrillar echogenic uh, lines, which are the collagen fibrils, and uh, is hyperechoic. Okay, so this patient presented with a painful lump on the medial foot, and the original history was to rule out ganglion cyst. Instead, we see this hypoechoic structure. Uh, and we see that if we look closely, there are fine hyperechoic lines within the structure. If you trace it proximally, you can see that it connects to the tibialis anterior tendon. So this is a tendinosis of the tibialis anterior tendon. Uh, but if you also look closely at the insertion, you can see that there's likely a, a longitudinal split tear within the tendon at its insertion. This patient presented with a pop followed by pain in the anterior ankle. And when you're scanning the anterior tibialis tendon, you can see it is no longer uh, extending across the joint but rather it is retracted uh, and you can see that it is somewhat wavy in its configuration because it has lost tension. You can see that it is hypoechoic and there is fluid in the tendon sheath. Distally, we find an empty tendon sheath, but as we scan more proximally, we find that the intact portion of the uh, tendon. This is a normal ankle joint anteriorly in the sagittal plane. We have the extensor hallucis as longus as extending across it but this is the area where you would be looking for ankle effusions. Moving on to the heel, patients may present with heel pain and what we will be looking for is plantar fasciitis. Now here's a normal plantar fascia. It has the appearance almost like a tendon or ligament. It uh, maintains a somewhat uh, constant thickness and as you can see here, it is attached to the calcaneus and it can extend distally toward the toes. Okay, and this is the structure that we're looking at right here. Okay, now plantar fasciitis normally affects the medial uh, portion of the heel. And so when you put your transducer right here, you would start medially to look for thickening. Now thickening can occur anywhere. And when it occurs distally, what we're talking about is plantar fibromatosis, but proximally, when you look at the plantar fascia, you're gonna see proximal thickening of the fascia as it is uh, attached to the calcaneus. So here is normal, here is abnormal. Normal is hyperechoic and attached to calcaneus. Abnormal is hypoechoic and thickened as it is attached to the calcaneus. And the patient will tell you that this correlates with the site of pain. Now ultrasound is also great in evaluating for foreign objects. 
And this is a patient who presents with foot pain after uh, a barbecue. The x-rays were negative, but when you look, you see this linear structure that is in their small toe, and this is a patient who has an embedded toothpick in their toe. One other thing that can uh, happen in the foot are Morton's neuromas. Now patients present with uh, forefoot pain, and what we're looking for is a mass in the inner metatarsal web space. So normal web space um, is usually hyperechoic because it is filled with fat. In an abnormal situation, you find a well-defined hypoechoic lesion, which is well-defined. Oftentimes when you press on this lesion, patients will confirm that they are feeling pain. But what you really want to see is you want to see the entering and the exiting nerve from this lesion. So here is that neuroma, here is that entering nerve and the exiting nerve. Now many times um, adjacent to the neuroma you'll find a fluid descended structure and that is the inner metatarsal bursa and the whole uh, entity is really a metatarsal bursa, inner metatarsal bursa and neuroma complex. So here we see that lesion in the inner metatarsal space. Adjacent to it is a hypoechoic or anechoic fluid collection. When you compress on it, you can flatten out that fluid collection, and what remains is the Morton's neuroma. And that ends this talk. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to email me at this address. Thank you.